Good afternoon, SOC203, Section F and H. Um, my apologies for not being able to join you in person today, but I am under the weather and it's taken me more than enough hot water and throat lozenges in a year than I'd like to have for me to get to this point, so bear with me, please. Um, I will cover everything exam-related in the next video, which should be linked with this. So if you want to know about the midterms, go and watch that video. It's very short. It's there. And all the information that you need is there. But don't forget, next Monday, during tutorial, is your midterm. So if it starts at 10.15, it starts at 10.15. So be there 10.05, 10.10, the latest. If you're at section H, 11.45, that's when it starts. So be there 11.35, 11.30. Um, and if you're registered with the Center for Accessibility, um, then you should be able to check that with your portal or they already contacted you because um, I already checked with the prof and uh, Dr. Dejeuner said it, it's, all, it's all set up there. So let's get started with today's chapter on division of labor, mechanical solidarity, organic solidarity, and how that all comes into play. First and foremost, uh, let's look at your reading reports. Um, be sure, please, I can't stress this enough, in your application section, don't use examples outside of the reading, right? I can't award you marks for that. So bring in concepts, maybe a phrase, a keyword within the reading. I can only award you marks for that. Please, 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 it's, it's so important. Like there's a big flow for everybody else. Many students are like going on in a flow and they show me they understand, but According to the mark scheme, right, the application needs to come from within the reading. So don't forget that. And the language for you and I are just fantastic. The writing is clear. Um, so well done, everyone. If you do choose to submit a reading report for the 23rd next Monday, which also is the same day as the midterm, uh, you can too. Uh, that's on Simone de Beauvoir. So make sure, you know, keep up with the clusters as well and the options. As always, um, reach out either from, to myself, to any of the TAs, to the prof, and the mental health resources with Concordia is there. Um, pace yourselves, right? Take care during this time. While you're there, take a sip of water too. That is way too hot. So I'm going to take you through three main points that I've kind of summed up, right? Mounted by many, the root of law is crime, and me is just we upside down. Imagine if you were an ant, right? And you're out there in the wild, in, in the forest, for example. Um, what do you do to survive? You ration the food, you delicate yourself some jobs, but obviously it's only limited within a day in your own energy, right? You meet an ant eater, and you're dead, right? But let's ignore the fact you know, that, oh gosh, the anteater will get you because you're just one person, right? Like the number, the smaller the number, the, 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 the less efficient you are to, to get a goal, right? To be a successful ant, right? To go to find another ant mound. Whatever it is, what, that is your collective common goal. Not just your own personal individual goal, but like a becoming of something, right? To succeed as an ant, a collective consciousness, a common of what it means to be successful, what it means to be you as a person of something bigger. Let's say, well, you know, you're also out in the wild with a bunch of other people, right? A bunch of other ants. That's not guaranteeing either that an anteater wouldn't come up and kill you all, right? So the question here isn't how many ants you can count, right, that survive and propel into a, a goal, a common goal, but rather how does that common goal matter to you? How do you make it count with what you have? And so it's not about the size of, of the, the people or the, the components to a group, but it's more about how do you delegate that meaningfully, efficiently, right? And so if you look at here, there are groups of ants, right? Individuals and then a group, a small selection. You then assign, obviously, each person or each ant within that group a role. Maybe they are in charge of cooking, construction, or even you know keeping the piece together. And this in itself is what Adam Smith, which Durkheim based off his division of labor chapter on, called the division of labor, right? Which is more development was because people divided their 
roles, right? It's not about the number of people, as we talked about. It's about how do you make that goal possible with what you have? How do you make it count? Not how, how do you count yourselves, right? How many people do you have? And so Durkheim actually looked at society too, or if we keep going with the ant metaphor, that there are so many. And within this kind of, if you zoom out, right, within society or within a group, there are many people doing things within a school, within a classroom on its own, right? Different students doing different roles. Some students are there keeping the peace by, you know, being calm and looking forward, not looking at their phones. They're maintaining that cohesion. Other students perhaps look around and say, shh, calm down, quiet. You know, they enforce it. Or some students kind of mend that tension a bit by not listening, speaking out loud, etc. So everyone's doing something at the individual level. But when you zoom out, as when you look at ants, it's just a bunch of static, right? And so the more socially integrated, that classroom still works because of the students, right? But the more socially integrated the members of a society are, the more they sustain diverse relationships. A classroom functions as it is, but also because there are many components of things happening in there that keeps it together. That static, even though we can't really understand, keeps it running. The hum, right, the buzz keeps it going. So Durkheim was rather interested in why, why that was. And so he asked, you know, how can a person be at the same time both more individual and more socially integrated at once? It doesn't make sense. You know, if you keep doing your role and pursuing your responsibilities, how do you, how do you tend to your own needs? Or vice versa, if you tend to your own needs, how does that assure that you go out there and you work for society, you go out and you contribute for, for the greater good, right? And so he divided within the individual two kinds of consciousness, right, or two kinds of being within the same. It's the common, right, which is I have to be out there, I have to be a good chef, I have to keep society fed, I have to keep the society constructed, keep the society um, um, disciplined, right. But also individually, because I keep the society well fed, I am assured that when I go back home, my house is constructed by people who eat my food. I am assured that when I go back home, my house and on the way there is safe because the peacemakers who are you know, guarding the streets are sustained by my food. You see, so there's, a, there's an interrelation there going on. Ants, as static as they are, keep this buzz, this hum. This cohesion is what Durkheim called social solidarity, or in very simple terms, how um, some things can stay together while on its own mini parts go out and about. And so he identified it as rather not a cognitive thing or a material thing, but it's a moral phenomenon. It's morality, right? You go out there and you be a good ant, not because there is a checkbook or there is a legitimate way to say what a good ant is, but rather we have changed our ways to see and make ways of seeing what a good ant could be. And so it's a completely moral phenomenon. And so Durkheim proposed that you know we can understand what social solidarity is or what's going on rather than looking at the similarities, because when you look at an ant mound, right, there's just black dots or red dots everywhere. It's hard to see the similarities. But if you look at the differences, and this difference is probably key. It's not just if something doesn't look the same, but as in a difference, right? Like you made a difference to someone's life, the effect rather. So rather than just looking for what it is, look at how it is. What does it affect on these individuals? Not look at, you know, these individuals are doing these things, they're doing these things because dot, dot, dot. So if we neglect all these differences, or if we don't think about, you know, how something creates this, how this buzz is maintained, then we won't understand anything. We'll just say that this society is functioning and this society is functioning and that society is functioning. There's no levels, there's no nuance in between, right? And it's, it's key to note here that he calls this the general tendency to sociability. Sociability isn't the fact of being outgoing or, or that it's society or whatnot. It's that hum, that buzz, the engine that keeps it going, right? The interactions that keep the static moving and it's always everywhere. I can go out there and I can dedicate to the common responsibility of feeding people, right? And in turn, when I come back home, 
I have a home or I had a home because people who built it fed on my food, right, that I made. So there is an interesting little change there of what do I demand from society, but also what society demands from me, right? And that's in between that, that's the social solidarity, right? What's going on? So there we go, mounted but many, just to keep the, the context there. So now we'll look at law, which Durkheim calls the most visible symbol of common consciousness or that we'll talk about. But if we wanted to in, in kind of understand you know, the social solidarity of why people do things, then, then let's have a look here. When you think back to that metaphor of the ant or yourself who needs to go out to work as a chef, etc., and in return to that, when you come home, the people who protect you, who built your houses, can do what they do and can still do what they are doing because you contributed to the food source that sustains them. Thus, they sustain you in other ways, right? And so you see this porousness, right? Within here, the middle part of that, between that is the law. If you approach why it is that I go to work with the law that says, because you have to pay taxes, you're already halfway in. It doesn't forego or doesn't look before that of, wait, this law is here that I have to pay my taxes, yes? But just before that, I have to pay my taxes, so I go to work. Because work gives me money to pay those taxes. On the same token, if the tax laws are happy and paid, then that means that people can work legally. There can be employment. And so if people can work legally and they can be employed, then they stay in their jobs and then they provide the services to me as a chef who needs a better home renovation or as a chef who needs to talk to the police because somebody stole my stuff. That law in the middle only gives us one small picture of it, right? It's incomplete data, as Durkheim says. It doesn't capture the whole thing, but it is an integral part to that thing because if that law isn't there, then there's no point for me to work to get the money. Right? That kind of individual and common consciousness won't come together. The, the more sustained that law is, the more social life can be sustained. Right, society, The general life of the society cannot be extended unless the judicial life is extended at the same time and in direct relation to it. Right? Does that make sense? But law has three conflicts, right? It can always tell what, when something is wrong. But who determines that, you know, it's still relevant? It, all kinds of things, right? But it's still there, right? It's still here today in our Constitution. We just overwrite new things, overwrite new laws, but we don't go back and look at it. And if we could, who should be able to do that? Is whatever it's protecting even still around, right? The second thing is law is private, but also public, which is what I talked about there, right? That law that Durkheim suggested that that law in the middle, that incomplete data, as it expands, as it allows for me to go to work and merge my individual and common together, then other people can also merge their individual and give back to the common, vice versa, right? But then private law, or rather morals, right? So like more tacit laws of if you walk into a shop and you have no a shoe and no shirt, perhaps if you have a policy here, you can refuse service. But if you walk into a store and you're loud or you fart too much, there's no law that says um, citizens with excessive flatulence must be denied uh, public service goods immediately. There's no law. Like Durkheim says, something is considered criminal because it offends the common consciousness, yes? For the first one, that the law can always say is what is wrong, but you know who says if it's right to remain? Durkheim says all, all punishment is the same. Let's, let's not look at the law, right? Let's just look at what the law does or what the law gets us to do. It's to punish, right? And he says a person might be speeding on a highway or a person might do some fraud or a person might loot, but most of it is just payment. The payment can be the same, the payment cannot be the same, 
but why did somebody decide that for three of these really completely diverse criminal acts, the punishment is the same medium? So Durkheim says, right, laws conflict with it being private but also being public, right, in each domain, punishment reflects the same thing. It's either repressive, which is to say, this is what you get for doing this, but also restitutive, which is to say, don't do this or else, all right, or don't do this again. It doesn't matter what it is, it still comes from the same moral ground of keep that social solidarity and follow the common consciousness, right, despite of which domain of life it's in, personal, public, etc. We then have the concept of common, or rather I'll call it the collective consciousness, right? I like that better. The collective consciousness, which is key to this, this chapter. And so let's recognize why it is important here, right? To understanding how, how law, the conflicts of the law, um, is spread out within the social fabric of everyday life. We rely on social solidarity. We rely that within a group's unity, it gives us specific characteristics, right? That's a quote that Durkheim says. Or rather, because everybody has to get together to make the economy great, or to make the country great again, or to pay taxes, as a matter of that social solidarity around that law, being judicial and moral, we all get awarded, right? We all sustain each other by sustaining ourselves. Our interests are also the country's interests, right? And so it gives us not only social solidarity that helps each other, but also our jobs, our division of labor to, to um, advance in our own. But also because we are advanced in our own domains, other people also advance because we help one another. At the higher level, which is the governing body, right? The people in charge, for example, their first duty, their only duty really, is to defend the common consciousness, yep? It's not to punish. Punishing comes later. And so society in this sense isn't just you and them, it's you be like us. And that us is on a group of people, that us is the collective consciousness of what it means to be a person, a good person, in this society at this time, right? It's always moral, enforced by law, can be punished, can be awarded, and this keeps us our aesthetics moving around right and so the governing body right the founding fathers um, the inventors the creators whatever it is they become collectivity incarnate and incarnate the sense means forever right eternal um, so that's why we evoke these bodies so much, the bourgeois, the fo founding fathers, the, the creators of the internet or whatever it is, right? We cite them in the same sentence as our moral judgments, right? Like for example, if you think about how you dress and about right, the common code of etiquette, right? The etiquette, you need to dress like a gentleman or you need to dress like a, a professional. Gentleman, professional, the bourgeois, don't dress like a working class, these people, they don't exist right now, or they do, but whom, which, right? It's all categories, it's all moral categories that come with it, the laws in which we enforce and sometimes are enforced by, to us, right? And so the collective consciousness is everywhere in society. It's, it's prevalent, it's always there. And so the root of law is crime, because law is the prevention bug spray to crime the bug that could be there. It's not there, but it could be there. So here, here's the bug spray. Here's this mouse trap, right? Always be anxious before. That's not our job per se. That's the job of the governing body. But it has bled so much into our everyday lives that we have to be cautious ourselves. And so as Durkheim says, this becomes an autonomous factor in life, right? It reacts against all forces, internal, external, that society um, creates crimes and offenses, right? It creates preventative barriers in which if you pass or if we say you pass, that marks to, for everybody else in this society, don't go there. We don't want you there. And so punishment, that difference that it makes on people, right? That difference that it makes in that it doesn't, it doesn't, re it resists 
society moving into another way, that difference that that punishment makes helps us understand the social effects of solidarity, right? Because all of us keep this running, and what is running is the law that is enforced through punishment. The third type is me is just we upside down. Um, let's see if you can understand this. <clears throat> so we already know here that within the individual, there is the individual and the common consciousnesses, right? Um, and in order to keep that tension at bay, we have all of these components to keep that together, right? And so we kind of, it's like a, a planet that is built, made of air, I suppose, whatever. But we are the, the asteroids, right, that move around. We do our trajectory. That's what the individual wants to do. But we're also grounded in the graffiti, right, of the common. So it, it works. It's par and par together. So let's talk about the last distinction that Durkheim brings up, right? Mechanical solidarity on organic solidarity, right? It's important here that he says mechanical solidarity arises from likeness, or rather, same interests, common interests, common bonds, right? And so mechanical solidarity enacts as its punishment a repressive is, this is what you get for doing this, right? It's homogenous, it's together, it's very united, right? And he says the word mechanical doesn't mean that it's fake, it's real, all right? But it just means that everything is just in place, like a conveyor belt, you're just locked in, right? For the conveyor belt to move, there needs to be a, the, like I don't know, a nail in there, th that nail being you. If the nail is gone, the conveyor belt can still move. But if you want to lock yourself in, the conveyor belt has to stop, right? So if you want to move around, for example, the engineers have to press pause. Society has to stop for you. Can't do that, right? So you stay in your place. And if you push that boundary, you will get this. This is what you get for doing that. So stay in your place. That's why he says it unites the elements or unites the, the, the larger being rather than individuals or living bodies, right? The mound must be, the mound must be in place, right? Doesn't matter about the ants. The mound has to be there. And so the common consciousness is what keeps this conveyor belt moving, right? That individual consciousness, which is linked to society, we are the rollers in that conveyor belt, um, is dependent on the collective consciousness, right? Wherever it moves, we have to move. We can roll as much as we want. I still am rolling in one place. And for better or worse, that doesn't speed up or slow down the conveyor belt, right? If you've been to the airports and the luggages are there, you can, you can spin the thing and the TSA agent just looks at you, but that doesn't matter. Be the same based on likeness as us because this is what you'll get. This is what you'll get if you do this. Don't push general social life until the judicial life allows you to. You are punished because you're not the same as us. Full stop. Nothing more of, you're punished because you're not the same as us, here's how you can be the same, right? Here's how you can use your quirk to complement our needs. No, you're different, get out, right? Repressive, this is what you get, full stop. And so it's like a seesaw, right? And the seesaw in the sense that if you do this crime, you're out. We're going on to talk about organic solidarity. And organic solidarity, rather than mechanical, which is you stay the same, you remain the same, is it moves around, right? That static can move around like the DVD corners that you know hit each other. I don't know if people know that anymore. It's restitutive, right? It wants to bring you back. It takes you back. Come back here. Come back here. Not push you out, but come back here. And so it acknowledges that within a division of labor, or rather in a society that is advanced, and thus there are more diverse relationships, okay, let's work with this division of labor, this a bunch of specialized individuals with a common goal, both of which cannot exist without one another. But it's the same, me and we, we depend on one another. We need each other. And then Durkheim, rather than you know the mechanical solidarity, which is law, is made to avenge something, is this is what you get. Durkheim raises the question of, wait, does law protect, right? Because if, or in organic solidarity, so many people are in a division of labor, right? They're going out here and there. The best thing you can do is to prevent them from going further, right? You can't control everybody. And so he asks, but does it really 
act as a protective force or more as a, a penal, a, a punishing force, right? He says nowadays, compared to primitive societies, punishment has changed, right? It's no longer to avenge, it's to defend, just like what the guarding uh, committee does, right? And here, it's arguable, too, that all laws are a precursor to crime. Not crime is a precursor to law. So how, how do we imagine this? If somebody breaks the law, as in they go out and they steal something, right? Or they go and kill somebody, for example, that leads to a law. That leads to a punishment. No. Because you do something, and then you get a punishment, like the seesaw back. That's not what he's arguing here. He said within an organic solidarity society, before you do that thing that is criminal, before you kill somebody, before you grab the knife, before you had intent of doing that, that already is admissible as a crime in the court of law. Meaning that when you think about a law, a court trial, right? People don't say and just don't focus on the fact that you killed this person this many times or only you stole this much goods, right? And right now in the market, this good equals to this much need for society. It's not that mechanical. It's not that definitive. It's the fact that when we're in the court of law, you think back and you collect evidence to, does this person have intent? Did this person know what they were doing? Did this person plan what they were doing? Did this person know how much it would affect the other person if they stole this thing? Did they know if this thing was valuable? Right, it's always before. So all laws come before the crime. So laws are a precursor to crime, as I talked about here, right? Literally, the terms and conditions that you Right? Being a law, I suppose, or a company law, a policy, as they call it, it's a precursor to you breaking those terms and conditions, right? Or a student handbook that you all sign, by the way, because you're here, right, student Concordia. If you break something of the student handbook, it's cited to you, and you're like, wait a minute, I wrote, I read that, right? Your passport, a book, that law in the middle, being there that says, if you do something wrong, we take this away from you, right? But it's the fact that because you have this book and you put your face on there and you sign your name on there, you agree to following that law of what it means to be in that society as defined by the governing body, right? And so mechanical and organic, whether it is based on likeness or due to division of labor, they have that same organic goal, right? Which is to sustain what it is that's in the middle. So Durkheim concludes that although they are distinct, these two consciousness, right, are linked together because they have the same basis. So whether the ants are all contributing to one main point of a society or a mound that is a constructive mound or a disciplined mound or a, a mound with great gastronomy history, right? Or within that mound, there are different components, different groups and individuals who are the gastronomy department, discipline department, etc. They all contribute to sustaining, regardless of what kind of society that is, a society, right? We need to sustain this. The TV needs to be on, therefore the hum needs to be there. And for the hum needing to be there, the static needs to move. Then that depends on the governing principle of how it is. Do we kick people out if they break, if they go across the, the, the frames of the TV? Do we get rid of them? That's mechanical. Or if the static is there, do we bring them back in? Organic. That comes right after the fact that the TV needs to be on, or that society needs to function because we function with it and it doesn't function without us. So here's a little infographic just for you to make sure that you, know, you can get this as well. Uh, for those of you in section F and H, thanks for bearing with me. <clears throat> I'm going to drink some water now. Um, and check out the other video about the exam preparation. Um, for those of you who aren't in my sections, hello. Um, I'll see you this week if you come by the exam session prep. Uh, take care.